welcome to High Noon, where we talk about controversial subjects, interesting people. And you might remember Nate Hawkman from the last time he was on here talking about uh, the future of the post-religious, right? Um, but he's a staff writer at National Review and a Publius Fellow with Claremont Institute. Um, you may have seen his various reporting and uh, opinion columns all over, certain, even even some places like the New York Times and... Um, but I wanted to have him back on to talk about his stellar reporting on a series of bills in South Dakota and kind of the story um, of, of a particular political battle in South Dakota over gender ideology. But I think it's much more relevant than just the single issue. I think it says so much about uh, the Republican Party, the forces operating within the Republican Party uh, that are, are somewhat behind the scenes. Um, and I think it's a, his reporting on this has been a must read and must understand uh, for every person who objects to leftist cultural hegemony in the United States. Um, so let's let's start at the beginning, Nate, um, with with the the simple women's sports bill a couple years back um, in, a, in a red state, South Dakota. Right. All it did was ban biological males from uh, women's sports. And uh, what happened next? Well, so just the pretext, just to so listeners understand how red South Dakota is. One of the things I was pointing out my reporting is by ideology, it's the third most conservative state in the country. So it really does not get more right wing than South Dakota, with a couple of exceptions. Um, you know, Republican super majorities in both chambers of the legislature since 1996. This is a deep red, super conservative state. And there's also polling to suggest that this women's sports bill that we we're talking about uh, in early 2021 was popular, uh, as you'd expect from a state that red. But when it got to Christy Nome's desk, she vetoed it. And Christy Nome at this time, now people have a lot of doubts about her, I think, for, for partially for, for the reason of her veto. But at the time, she was a rising star in the GOP because her kind of self-presented uh, public persona was as the, the one governor who's, who didn't lock down her state during COVID. And it's true that South Dakota didn't lock down, although that was for reasons uh, not having to do with Christy Nome, which we can get into later. Um, but she was sort of seen as a conservative fighter. So it took a lot of conservatives, including a lot of conservatives who were fans of hers by surprise, that she would veto this bill, which seems like common sense, right? Biological males in women's sports, just like an easy conservative win. Uh, and what some reporting that I did and some reporting that some other intrepid uh, conservative journalists did revealed was that a large part of uh, her motivation for the veto was her very close relationship to Sanford Health, which is by far the largest employer in, in the state of South Dakota by a degree of almost 700%. It's this big healthcare pharmaceutical company based in Sioux Falls. And it had vested interests in uh, a variety of aspects of the transgender agenda. It, it sold and profited off of puberty blockers for minors, um, uh, you know, sex change surgeries, et cetera, et cetera, it performed sex change surgeries in the state even. Uh, but it also had just announced on the same day that Christy Nome uh, issued her veto, a uh, hundred plus million dollar expansion of Sanford Sports Complex, which is I think the largest sports complex in the state of South Dakota, which had brought some of the first NCAA uh, games to the state. Um, and uh, if, if you sort of follow the history of these fights at the state level, the NCAA had boycotted states like uh, North Carolina in the past for similar transgender bills. So they stood to lose a lot of money uh, from that, as well as being bought into the transgender agenda at large. And Christy Nome had very close relationships with them, as did a lot of South Dakota Republicans. Her closest advisor in her office uh, was a registered Sanford lobbyist. And I had people inside Nome's office feeding me stories about how they had seen this advisor slash Sanford lobbyist come in and kill social conservatives be bills before, including lobbying internally against this women's sports bill. So top to bottom, the story of this veto was really the larger story of the influence of this very culturally left-wing company based in Sioux Falls in South Dakota. And what we learned, both from the known veto and then subsequent stories, is that the, that very left-wing interest um, had its talons in a large part of the South Dakota GOP, which is why the South Dakota GOP has been so reticent up until now to really do anything on transgender issues, because they know where their bread is buttered. Right. So, I mean, th this is obviously a story about corporate influence. And um, 
you know, the Republican Party has had a long, I mean, even before our current era of, of politics, right? The Republican Party has been identified as the party of business for a long time. Um, there are lots of indices uh, where red states compete on who has the best business climate. Uh, there are a lot of benefits that are handed out by red states to various large corporations. Um, and, and this relationship kind of worked for a long time between the Republican Party, um, especially in small red states, attracting large corporations to that state. And obviously there are, there are economic benefits to doing that for the people of that state. Um, you know, Texas famously uh, hands out tax benefits left and right for, um, for companies coming to the state. But as the business sector became more and more culturally left wing, for a variety of reasons, institutionally, culturally left wing, um, they they have started to essentially um, use those relationships that were formed over economic interest on these cultural issues. So, what what happened once you initially reported that Sanford Health had had a large hand in killing this very popular um, initiative in, in South Dakota and had done it through Republicans? Right. So you're absolutely right. This is something I pointed out before. The that relationship between kind of the big business interests at the state level and, and at the national level, the kind of chamber of commerce wing of the GOP and a lot of business Republicans made more sense in an era where you didn't have big business lobbying for things like youth sex changes. Um, I, I still think that even if you look at back in the 90s when the chamber of commerce was kind of a solidly Republican constituency, there were real places where the business community's interests were at odds with conservatives, most notably immigration. Right. If you look at the kind of Bush amnesty push in the early aughts, uh, that was all the Chamber of Commerce that was and, and their sort of associated groups because they profit from and, and benefit massively from importing a lot of cheap labor. So there were always places where they broke, but it kind of made sense, even if it, it, Chamber of Commerce Republicans aren't my kind of Republican, that they were kind of a constituency within the GOP. And what you've seen, as everyone I'm sure who watches your show is familiar with, as big business has moved radically to the left on cultural issues, whether it's kind of DEI and CRT, you know, BLM, the trans issue, you name it, uh, you've seen some Republicans, particularly at the state level, who kind of occupy that chamber of commerce wing, move left with them, uh, rather than kind of drawing a line in the sand and saying, no, we're not going to follow you left. Uh, and that's that's what happened with a lot of South Dakota Republicans. So. This gnome veto, she got an enormous amount of backlash, deservedly so, uh, for it, not just from me. I mean, I spent a couple months on this really sort of in-depth investigation about her relationship to Sanford, but even just at face value, you had everyone from Tucker Carlson to The Federalist to, you know, all the kind of major right-wing pundits uh, kind of taking gnome to the cleaners uh, for this veto, because it was just the wrong move, regardless of what the motivation was. And to her credit, she did uh, end up coming around to the right position and reintroducing a uh, basically analogous bill that got signed the next legislative session, I believe, that did ban uh, uh, biological males in, in women's sports. Uh, so, so it is the law of the land in South Dakota now. Um, but I think what that episode represented is just that the incentive structure, particularly at the state level, where they sort of uh, a lot of kind of Republicans, kind of local lawmakers are under much less scrutiny uh, from from conservative media, conservative constituents, et cetera. A lot of voters in states like South Dakota think understandably that if you vote for someone with an R next to their name, they're going to fight for your values. Whereas obviously, if you look at episodes like this one, that's not always the case. Um, but the incentive structure until that scrutiny is applied is to basically go along with business because they're the powerful interests in that state. They're the ones who are donating to your campaign. They're the ones that are all at all the big fundraisers. So their worldview kind of just becomes your worldview. And un unfortunately, in issues like this one, uh, people like Christy Nome weren't going to do the right thing until someone basically made them do the right thing. And eventually she did. Uh, but it was evidence of the sort of pre-existing incentive structure, which militates in favor of some very not conservative and even radical things uh, in cases like this one. Yeah, the only the only comparison that I can think of uh, from sort of the pre-political era other than the immigration comparison which is just not on the state level as much i mean they're obviously there are states dealing very much with the impact of unrestrained immigration uh, but obviously ultimately immigration policy is at least supposed to be set by the federal government um the, the other example of this kind of dynamic that i saw which had nothing to do with private industry actually was in red states over school choice right because mm -hmm. um in, in a lot of 
red states, the there were some very powerful lobbying interests associated with the public schools and also superintendent associations and various, um, you know, other associations of, of school adjacent. Uh, and, and, and at some point, this pulled apart, right, as as the schools went more and more culturally left wing. And obviously, COVID completely blew this up and the shutdowns of the schools completely blew up this kind of relationship between the teachers unions, um, between superintendents between generally public school interests in states and Republicans. Were, but but prior to that, um, there was a very cozy relationship between this. And, and, and to some extent, it makes sense, right? Like, these are law districts. Um, the school district is the largest employer of, you know, um, of people in that district. So it makes sense that, that uh, you know, there are some legitimate interests to balance here is what I'm saying. It's not only the the lobbying and the big dollars. There's also, you know, the, especially for a small state like South Dakota, you know, there's the legitimate business interests. You know, you don't want to collapse employment in your state by having something like Sanford Health pull out of your state, right? right. Um, but how how do... Um, Republicans or conservatives successfully navigate those kinds of, of contradictory incentives um, when they're not just, you know, sort of uh, orthogonal. The, 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 these business interests are now no longer just orthogonal to like other conservative interests. They are actively some of the most uh, powerful um, interests opposing conservatives on things as fundamental as male and female biology, right? On things as, as fundamental as, um, you know, for example, uh, like BLM was another one and racial issues, another fault line where you had a lot of these corporations actively um, lobbying or, or voting laws, for example. Another example where where Delta was actively lobbying in, in the Georgia legislature against uh, a bill to tighten up um, election security, right? And and then threatened to, to pull out. Um, and there, there was an interesting pushback as well. But how do you see these kinds of relationships developing going forward or changing go going forward? Because uh, it seems like, especially with your reporting and with other people's reporting, um, this is coming to a head, right? These these fights are becoming public and, and cannot be done behind closed doors the way even like three years ago, I think a lot of these deals were done before behind closed doors. And now people are, are much more like average voters are much, much more suspicious of business interests. Yeah, as they should be. If you look at, you know, what's happened in recent years, I mean, you brought up the, the fight in Georgia, obviously the DeSantis versus Disney stare down over the so-called don't say gay bill, the parental rights and education bill was another big example. And what DeSantis, I think, demonstrated, and to be fair, Brian Kemp as well, who stood up to Delta and these other big businesses and MLB, um, was that actually, if you do stand up to these business interests that are militating against the interests of your voters, your voters will reward you for it. Right. They, what they what they what Republican voters are desperate for is a, is strong Republican leaders who are willing to represent them rather than business interests. And they're they're so desperate for it that in the rare but I think um, in a welcome way, increasingly uh, uh, sort of uh, frequent examples of, of Republicans actually standing up to them, uh, they will see them as heroes. Um, and, and that's a large part of how DeSantis has certainly built his brand. The first sort of. I have a long essay about a lot of this stuff coming out in, uh, I think, the next issue of the National Review magazine. I'm kind of tracing the genealogy of the GOP's relationship to left-wing business interests. Um, and the first kind of high-profile example, you saw this new phenomenon where these powerful business interests in conjunction with powerful left-wing activist groups and an activist left-wing media sort of parachute into red states and overrule the kind of democratic process was the RIFRA fight in Indiana in 2015, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. The, the same sort of bill or an analogous bill had, I think, been passed in 17 states already. It was an easy gimme kind of like conservative religious liberty uh, expansion bill. Uh, and Indiana, you know, the, the, the governor at the time was Mike Pence, who was ostensibly kind of a rock-ribbed man of the religious right. It passed the Indiana legislature, I think, by supermajority margins. And then there's this massive backlash, threats of boycotts from all of the big Indiana businesses, a flurry of negative media coverage in the national press. People poured out into the streets in protests, kind of spurred on by these activist groups. Uh, and within, I think, like three days, they were signing this, this RIFRA fix, Pence was, um, that had also just passed through the legislature that wrote sexual orientation and gender identity into the state anti-discrimination law for the first time in Indiana history. So that was a big kind of, I think, moment for conservatives kind of stepping back and going, whoa, 
I think we need to reassess our relationship with these business interests that we've traditionally kind of gone along with because they are militating for these extremely anti-conservative initiatives. You saw it again in North Carolina, I think in 2017 or 2018 with the bathroom bill, right? That banned uh, transgender bathroom use, basically. It ma mandated that bathroom use correspond with biological birth sex. Um, that lasted for a year rather than three days. So it did a little bit better than uh, the Indiana RIFRA bill, but the same thing happened. Threats of boycotts, I think some actual boycotts materialized and uh, North Carolina Democrats along with the Chamber of Commerce wing of the North Carolina GOP, which in a lot of state GOPs is sometimes even the majority of the GOP. Um, deep red states aren't always very conservative states. If you actually look under the hood, uh, they rewrote it because they were more concerned kind of about um, the business interests that they were cozy with and, and their interests than social conservatism. And then obviously South Dakota was another example um, of this. So I I'm glad you brought up the fact that there are legitimate interests to be represented because I think lobbyists completely deservedly have a bad name and people use the term lobbyist kind of as a, almost like a cuss word, right? Like you, the way people talk about them. And, and that's for good reason. I mean, I just spent like three months doing a, a reporting project about how awful <laughs> these lobbyists were uh, in South Dakota, but kind of lobbying properly understood is just the representation of a particular interest uh, in the kind of democratic process, right? So you have a business community that has shared interests or a school district that has shared interests and they kind of band together, they make a group for lobbying and they go to the you know state capital or whatever and they explain their pers particular perspective on an issue and how a particular piece of legislation is gonna affect their kind of participation in, in public life. Uh, and it's a really important actual tool for legislators to understand, you know, these competing interests, right? Like, okay, so this legislation passes, it's going to have this effect on schools, it's going to have this effect on business, et cetera. But what legislators are supposed to do is consult those different competing interests and kind of hear them out and then make the decision in terms of what's best for their community and their state. And ultimately, if you're in a deep red state and you're a Republican who claims to be a conservative for, you know, basic conservative ideas about human nature, community, politics, et cetera. And what you've seen instead, again, in the kind of Chamber of Commerce wing of the GOP in places like South Dakota, is that their word is basically just law, right? What Sanford says for a, a segment of the most powerful Republicans in South Dakota, that's just what we do because it's Sanford. And, you know, that's how we've done things for a very long time. That's not what originally lobbying was supposed to represent. And it's not what self-government is supposed to look like when the people who elected you are getting something very different than they thought they were getting when they actually voted for you and very different than what you promised them uh, when you when you campaigned for their votes uh, and very different than the actual interests of your state. You're just going along with this powerful business interest that donates to your campaign, that shows up at your fundraisers, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that has to end. And I think there are some good trends in this in the right direction because of things like the RIFRA fight, the North Carolina bathroom bill, Disney, Georgia, South Dakota. Republicans are, are understanding that this is no longer acceptable to Republican voters. Uh, but until you kind of co consistently apply this scrutiny, there are going to be a lot of Republicans, particularly at the state level, who think they can get away with it, right? Path of least resistance is often going along with the business community. And the only way to change that, I think, is to change the actual incentive structure. Yeah, I mean, um, something else that I think a lot of people aren't aware of on the state level, I used to work uh, in state level politics, uh, not as a lobbyist, but as like a policy wonk helping to deal with education, uh, education bills in a wide number of states. Um, and one of the things I think very few people realize is, you know, state legislators almost always part time. Um, they're not fully paid. They don't have staff most of the time. So actually these lobbying interests, lobbying is very different on the state level um, because oftentimes they're the only ones with the expertise to write the bill, mm -hmm. right? So there's all kinds of policy choices that have to be made uh, in in any like given area. And the legislature legislators are not like, because they're not full time, because they don't have staff independently working for them, um, right? They, they develop relationships with sometimes, and, and you know, it's always lobbyists. If it's the other guys, it's it's public interest when it's our team, right? Mm -hmm. um, but essentially, these are, are um, people who have subject matter expertise. And so they're often selling, yes, with a perspective, and that's understood by both sides, but they're often essentially 
also selling their expertise matter, which yes. on the federal yes. level, yes. lobbying is actually much uglier in my view, because it's mostly selling access, right? It's, mm -hmm. I know this person, I have the ear of this person um, in power. So you're going to pay me to kind of Sherpa your issues to this person's ear. Um, but still something obviously that is and probably should remain legal in the United States. But uh, it's, it's a very different thing on the state level where you're dealing with people who maybe, you know, are only earning $10,000 to do this job of, of legislating. They have other, you know, they have another full time job, they have families like um, this really is self government in, in a large degree. Um, but th there has been this just like huge divorce. Um, very well recognized by Republican voters um, and seemingly still, even today, um, maybe, as you're saying, more people are becoming aware, more Republicans are being aware that this is not acceptable, um, that this, they are actually selling the farm. Um, they're not just taking advice or considering business interests in, in, in all of this. They're, they're actually selling out their voters and that voters aren't going to tolerate this. Um, you know, we've had we've had a few success stories that you're pointing to, right? I, I would call RIFRA a total failure, right? They passed this milk toast bill that didn't really do the job, um, and it was a clear capitulation. Same, and th there's been a few success stories. One was, I think, the Delta incident in Georgia, where they threatened to take, um, or as you said, th Kemp threatened to revoke certain tax benefits. Uh, special tax benefits that Delta had for keeping its hub in in, um, in Atlanta, right? Yeah. Um, and, and that was enough to get them to some extent to back down and shut up. Um, DeSantis obviously scored a huge victory in this regard over Disney, which is a huge employer in the state. What are the dynamics that made those fights? And maybe you can add if you think there have been more, plus this, and, and we'll get to this in a minute, that this, this South Dakota story that we're focusing on has a, a happy ending as of just a couple days ago, right? Um, but this bill did make it over the finish line um, despite these interests. So what is changing aside from the fact already mentioned that Republican voters are not tolerating this anymore? What What is changing that we are able to win some of these battles um, in a way that we have until I think, um, until the, the Kemp victory, until the, the Georgia victory, basically everyone, and maybe you can correct me, every one of these battles I can think of was a failure for social conservatives. They got rolled over by business interests. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I think before we talk about that, it's, it's important to sort of acknowledge like the differences between these states. And it gets to a lot of the really important points you're making about the reason that lobbyists have so much sway in a lot of these state capitals. South Dakota is a state with less than a, a million full-time residents. It's extremely rural. Um, the reason that Sanford Health, Sanford Health is really the only game in town. The reason that it employs almost seven times more than anything else in the state is just because there aren't big business interests except for Stanford in the state. And uh, legislators are part time. They get paid, I think, like fourteen thousand dollars, you know, at least for base pay uh, in terms of their their actual uh, salary for the legislature. And you had people who are actually full time Stanford employees working in the legislature as elected Republicans, including one uh, who is a public affairs specialist, which basically just means lobbyist, although he's not actually registered as a lobbyist, who was, there's, there was no kind of like division between his job as a Sanford representative who was supposed to be actively sort of lobbying for Sanford interests and his job as a legislator. So, you know, th what do you think he's gonna do when he's paid something like $65,000 from Sanford and $14,000 from his job as a, as, a, as a legislator? Who do you think he's going to primarily be loyal to when he actually goes and tries to do the people's business in the state capitol? Probably the people who are paying him, you know, exponentially more and the people who are kind of his full-time job, which is Sanford. Um, so because the legislature is part-time, like it is in a lot of states, because South Dakota is a very small, sparsely populated rural state without a lot of big institutions, um, the business interests in that state, specifically Sanford and its kind of um, its activist counterparts, uh, hold a disproportionate sway uh, on how legislators do business. If you look at uh, uh, Florida or Georgia, and I, I think we should give Kemp and DeSantis all the credit that they're due for, for standing up to these business interests. It was not an easy decision. But Disney's a big business interest, but it's not the only game in town in Florida, right? I mean, Florida has Miami. It has all these other big kind of, uh, you know, attractions. There are a ton of different competing interests. Uh, Disney is only one, right? Same thing in Georgia, right? Atlanta is a major metropolis. Uh, and something like MLB or Delta, they're important, 
but they're not the only game in town. So the one of the problems that I think red states generally face, although there's a lot of diversity that we just talked about, is the fact they often are more rural, often are more sparsely populated. And that means that these really powerful business interests often with kind of national profiles, right? Sanford, I think is like a, it's a multi-billion dollar company. I don't wanna misstate exactly how much it's worth. Uh, just their power is, is much more um, kind of a, it's, it's much more pronounced than something like New York or California where they just wouldn't, they'd be up against a lot of other equally powerful interests. Um, so, so that again, it's, it's about an incentive structure and the incentive structure, if you're a South Dakota Republican, I'm not giving them a free pass, but I think it's just, it's important to sort of understand the dynamic, um, is one in which the, you know, the, the kind of, you know, if you, if you do the, the, if you do something that gets on the wrong side of Sanford, the consequences are going to be much more significant than if you just kind of go along with them. And the reason I think that you're starting to see a shift, although we still have a long way to go, and I'm sure we're going to see more losses like this before, you know, the entire GOP gets on board, uh, is that there's increasing scrutiny from Republican voters who are just completely fed up with this. If you look at polling, you know, Republican voter trust in, in big businesses and institutions has, has precipitously dropped in the last few years. And there's more con con, uh, scrutiny from conservative media as well, which is kind of following this trend as well. Um, and that means that there are actually real political consequences now for going along with Sanford when it's at odds with conservative interests. And that means that when, if you're kind of a Republican state legislator or a governor like Christy Nome, you have to take that into account when you're making a decision. And it's not just an easy kind of consequence free move to go along with Sanford. And, you know, Christy Nome and some other South Dakota Republicans learned that the hard way, but the hope is that going forward, other Republicans who might be inclined to do that look at something like that as an example and understand that there are going to be consequences if they if they go along with big business when it's militating for left-wing cultural agendas um, and they make the right decision. And I think that changing incentive structure is kind of happening. It's in the process of happening right now. So what I was thinking about um, when you were talking about the issues that rural states and small states are having with this, the very real like problem of balancing these interests um, is, is the flag of the, of the colonies, right? Uh, during the revolutionary war, unite or die. Um, is, is there a role for some kind of coordination between red states on these kinds of issues? Cause some of these seem so local, right? Sanford is not a, um, you know, a big power player in all 50 States, right? Um, I don't know which legislatures it is, but I would imagine its power is very focused in South Dakota. Um, but there just seems to be a lot of benefit to red States coordinating on issues like this, where, uh, let's say there's a company that's threatening to to pull out or to boycott on some cultural conservative issue on any one of these states. Um, if there was some kind of solidarity between a bunch of these Republican states, well, that's, I mean, because of, of the fiscal conservatism relatively of the Republican Party um, for the last several decades, I can imagine a situation in which your only option, if you're one of these corporations um, and you want to to pull out of a red state over a cultural issue. If there was some kind of solidarity between these different states, then your only options would be to go to somewhere with a substantially higher tax burden, substantially higher re regulatory burden. In other words, right, there would be a cost extracted for your activism. No longer can you just slap up, you know, the, the BLM, whatever statement. Um, no longer can you call Georgia's voting laws, Jim Crow 2.0, right? Um, no longer can you lobby for the mutilation of minors um, in South Dakota without in, you know, essentially having to, to make your bed with the new party that you are, are benefiting, right? Like align your cultural views. Okay. Well then also you're going to pay California and New York taxes, right? Mm -hmm. um, make it a real financial cost. Do you see any potential for that kind of solidarity between red states? Cause it seems to me that these, these states like South Dakota, I mean, Christy Noem aside, I mean, and I, I, I mean, I think sh she was completely craven reading your, your reporting on this and others reporting on this, like, I'm no way excusing her behavior, but I do think there's a very real balancing problem here, especially the smaller 
the smaller your state is and the fewer business interests are aligned or, 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 or based in that state. So is there the potential for red states to help each other out here? Or is this by nature? Have you discovered that it's, it's just so individual? In other words, Delta is so important specifically um, in, in Georgia, but, you know, maybe very not important to a bunch of other states. Is there any room for alignment on this, I guess, is what I would say. Yeah. To your point about Nome, to be clear, it would be devastating for South Dakota if Sanford left, right? I mean, largest employer by degree of, like I said, almost seven times, you know, if largest philanthropist in the state. The state's richest man is T. Denny Sanford, who uh, also is, I think, currently in court for a child porn charge, which is a completely different, very weird uh, situation. Um, but uh, but he is a, a, a philanthropist. Uh, and, you know, Sanford's name is on everything. They have the hospitals, et cetera, right? Like it would, it would completely decimate South Dakota civil society. Um, but I don't think Sanford is going to leave because, and I think this gets to, to your point, this is why I think Republicans can feel confident standing up to a lot of these companies, particularly in the situation of Sanford in Sioux Falls. You know, the corporate executives care much more ultimately about their bottom line than these kind of boutique cultural activist issues. And it's also a question of incentive structure. The reason a lot of these corporate, for the most part, at the highest level, at the C-suite level, corporate executives aren't really true believers, right? They are also following the path of least resistance. And for the past few decades, the path of least resistance is go along with left-wing activists because the kind of, um, the sort of formula that was built in was, well, you can kind of run roughshod over social conservatives because they're never going to do anything, right? They're going to cut your taxes anyways and give you tax benefits to move to the state. Uh, but if you run roughshod over these left-wing activist groups, it's going to be a big problem uh, and, and you're going to get punished for it. And Republicans pushing back, I don't think is going to get, you know, something like Sanford Health leaving South Dakota. It's just going to make corporate executives more reticent to uh, engage in this because they understand that, to your point, it would be much more devastating to have to pay New York or, or California tax rates than it would to just abandon lobbying for, you know, the mutilation of 12 year old boys and girls. Um, so, so understanding that that is not really a real risk for most of these, these states, the idea of coordination, I think is great. I'd have to think more specifically about what that would look like in terms of like a material governors getting together and coming up with some kind of plan. But if all of the Republican states get on board with the program and get on board with the agenda and start pushing back on this, you're going to completely change the broader paradigm in the country because all of these major corporations that are based in Republican states because they like their tax rates um, are going to realize kind of collectively, because all these corporate executives hang out with each other, they go to the same conferences, right? They're part of the same sort of social strata, are going to realize that you can't get away with just kind of walking all over social conservatives anymore. Uh, and I think they that they are going to slowly but surely change their tune. Now, it's not that's I don't mean to be naively optimistic, right? There's an extremely powerful set of entrenched and uh, influential interests that are pushing these trends, and it's kind of the generational challenge of our time to actually overcome those interests. But it is kind of the first step in the long march back through the institutions for Republican governors to make it clear uh, that we're not working with the incentive structure of 2010 anymore or even 1990, um, and that in, in all of their different states, uh, this is now like the red line that you're not going to cross, right? And if you want to continue to enjoy our tax rates, which you do, and you don't want to have to pay California tax rates, um, you're going to have to check the transgender activism, the BLM, the DEI, the CRT at the door, and then we can kind of have a healthier relationship, um, reverting to the kind of relationship that we had in the past. Um, so I had Daryl E. Paul on this podcast talking about the dynamics within these companies, because you said the CEOs are not activists. And I think that's true for the most part today. Um, but they're in responding to their own incentive structures. In other, in other words, the, the factor here is going to be their workforce. Mm -hmm. Um, so now we have a much more remote workforce, a lot of, especially with larger corporations. Um, a lot of these companies may have a large percentage of their professionals, um, Either they will be living in in blue states anyway, or um, they will have come through universities. They will be just as left wing as uh, as California and Californians and New Yorkers, right? The specific band of um, managerial and professional types that a certain type of large, for example, tech companies or or other kind of large kind of 
national or multinational corporations are hiring are going to have very dedicated beliefs um, about, as, as we say, mutilating children um, and permitting gender affirming care. Sorry, you can hear my cat. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but so so these companies uh, are going to have internal pressure building as well to make those decisions. You know, how how is the reality of um, of these corporations and their workforces going to start impacting this? Because on the one hand, you could say it's maybe it's better if they just have a large part of their workforce in California, they, they won't have as strong um, an influence within these states. But but on the other hand, um, to the extent that they are still large employers and they are still building stadiums and putting their names on things and et cetera, et cetera, um, they may be governed more by the interests of their professional class um, within the corporation, even then, you know, preferring a 15% tax rate to a 38 one. Absolutely. And this is why I don't want to be naively optimistic, because like I said, this really is the challenge of our time in terms of kind of the war for the preservation of, uh, of American self-government. Um, the, the pressures and the kind of um, classes and interests in these major kind of Fortune 500 or just a step below Fortune 500 uh, corporations that are pushing them towards this radicalism, uh, it's, it, it comes from a, a couple different sort of groups that are both internal and external. So internally, it's coming disproportionately from the younger employees who are coming in from elite college campuses with a much more radical and aggressive worldview than their predecessors who also were often less likely to come from elite college campuses in the first place. And it's worth noting also generally this kind of disposition towards deferential uh, attitudes towards hierarchy and authority that make them um, much less likely to kind of cede any of these issues to the executives, right? They were formed on college campuses in an era where it was encouraged for students to yell at professors, right? And, you know, form these like activist groups and do sit-ins and, you know, the administration demanding, you know, uh, black studies or something like that, right? Like that's the kind of um, uh, ethos that they were, that they were formed within. And the result of that is that they are much more militant, even just a year or two after coming to the company and pushing for this stuff, because that was kind of their kind of cultural heritage. Um, so it's younger employees who are woker, to use the kind of term of art, and more aggressive in lobbying for their, their cultural agenda. It's this kind of strata that exists across different corporations and inside and out of them that's kind of like the HR DEI bureaucracy. A lot of corporations now have built basically the equivalent of what they have on college campuses, which are like diversity and inclusion bureaucracies, which, you know, their entire function basically is to agitate within a company for these policies, both internally and externally, to turn the, these, these, these corporations into activist lobbying groups. Um, and they also exist externally in terms of the DEI consultants that these companies are kind of bullied into, into bringing in. And then the, the other external pressures that they get are these major national activist groups, which uh, their bread and butter, again, is basically coming to corporate executives and saying, we're going to make your lives hell if you don't support this, if you don't boycott this, you don't lobby this. That's precisely what we saw in the Indiana RIFRA fight. It was a bunch of corporations who initially when RIFRA was going through, didn't have anything to say about it. It wasn't even on their radar. And then a bunch of national activist groups, you know, the Human Rights Campaign, ACLU, et cetera, came to the corporation and said, you're going to boycott Indiana or you're going to be on you know, the front page of our website tomorrow and you're going to be getting calls, et cetera. Um, so that's a very, very powerful set of kind of uh, a coalition of different forces that are pushing these corporations in the wrong direction. Um, and corporate executives, insofar as I think most, although there, there are plenty of exceptions, aren't true believers, are kind of facing a time for choosing. Um, they have to decide if they are going to sort of bend the knee uh, and and sort of take this from the activists, understanding that that means their tax rates are going to get you know, uh, jacked up. Their regulatory environment is going to be awful because they're going to have to move to California if Republicans stand up to them. Um, or if they're going to kind of draw the line and say, if you want to work here, if you want to enjoy a six-figure salary and the prestige that comes from working at you know, X company, uh, you have to, to check this kind of cultural militancy at the door as well. And you've seen a little bit of that, right? Like there's some high profile examples of like Netflix basically saying, uh, we're going to stop this craziness. We're just going to go back to being Netflix. There are a couple other examples as well. 
Uh, but it's very much an open question. I wish I had a more optimistic answer about this is going to happen. It's very much an open question as to whether or not they're going to do that. Um, and I think that the, again, like the sort of coordination question, it has a lot to do with how many of those corporations do it. It's kind of like a prisoner's dilemma. If one corporate executive stands up uh, and does it and no one else does, he's going to get thrown to the lions. But if these activists, sort of militant foot soldiers who are coming into the company uh, suddenly face an entire environment in which all the corporate executives are saying, we're not going to do this anymore, they don't really have anywhere to go. Um, so that will also be a really interesting trend to watch uh, for the next, de next decade or so. So th this particular story has a happy ending um, in South Dakota. So could you tell us what, what, are, the, uh, what are the events in, in South Dakota over this bill um, or this concept, I should say, because there were two different bills involved, three actually. Um, but uh, what, what's the conclusion of this particular fight with these particular interests um, and what's happened in the last few days? So yesterday, Christy Nome signed this new help, not harm bill, which is a ban on so-called gender affirming care for minors. It's either under 16 or under 18. And also a right of action, I think importantly, opening up the ability of uh, victims of these procedures uh, who were kind of carted into the doctor's office because they had a mental health issue, you know, pumped full of puberty blockers, woke up five years later and realized it was a horrible mistake to sue their doctors uh, who, who engaged in that. Uh, which again, major shift in the way that the doctors who are engaging in this stuff and the healthcare companies they hail from uh, actually will think about their, their job in, in, this, in this area, at least in South Dakota. And it was a major victory because the, almost the exact same bill got killed in the Senate Health and Human Services uh, uh, Committee in South Dakota in 2020. And no one almost certainly would have vetoed it if it, if it had passed uh, that committee. That committee is also populated by Sanford loyalists. Um, and, and Noam, I think, explicitly criticized it, but it never got to her desk. She's been able, until that, that women's sports veto, she, veto, she's been able to evade scrutiny because usually she relies on her allies in the legislature to kill it before it gets to her desk. But it made it through the Senate Health Human Services Committee this time after our piece kind of made a splash. And Noam knew that if she vetoed it, it she'd have hell to pay. So she, she, she signed it eventually as well. Um, so that, again... Is that's the second time that scrutiny has basically worked in South Dakota, right? The first was a women's sports bill, and the second was this help not harm bill. Um, and what it shows is that I think a lot of these Republicans will do the right thing if you drag them kicking and screaming uh, to do the right thing eventually, uh, because again, the incentive structure has shifted. But a lot of them won't do the right thing until scrutiny is applied. And a lot of Republican voters have better things to do than kind of dig through, you know, spend months like I did digging through different kind of congressional hearings and lobbying reports and expenditures, et cetera. Uh, so this is where I think and at the risk of sort of uh, being self-flattering to my profession, which I don't want to do. This is where I think conservative media actually has a really important role to play because you can have a major effect because Republican voters get their news disproportionately from conservative media. That's how they kind of form their, their kind of idea of what's going on in their state and beyond. And they are not okay with this stuff, uh, but it's often not until someone actually takes the time and the effort to investigate it that they're even made aware of it in the first place. I think one of the problems with conservative media is that we're so desperate for heroes uh, that we, and we spend all our time attacking Democrats, which we should be doing, um, that we, are very reticent a lot of the, a lot of times to investigate Republicans, particularly Republicans that we've made heroes, right? So Christy Nome, we desperately wanted her to be this conservative fighter who you know stood up to lockdowns and fought the biomedical security state, uh, and no one really wanted to look at the dark side. Um, and when I and some other folks actually did, you know, the, the the kind of everything changed. But it wasn't until conservative media actually held. Republicans to account that, 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 that all of that did change. Um, so conservative media obviously needs to be going after Democrats, but they also need to be making sure that their party, the Republican Party, is in fighting shape, because uh, otherwise attacks on Democrats are just going to bounce off. Yeah, I mean, I think we definitely saw that during the midterms, right? Um, but I, I guess I have, I have one final question for you on this. We've talked a lot about the Republican Party, uh, and obviously in South Dakota, that's pretty much all there is. Um, there, there's a few lingering Democrats, but how is this dynamic going to change the Democratic Party? Because um, it seems to me that 
a lot of corporations, they split their donations, Republicans, Democrats, they want to have, you know, sort of a foot in each camp so that they can talk to the right people and, and, and lobby as we've been talking about. Um, but it seems to me that, that, that these, these corporations are swinging very hard um, into the Democratic column. And, and as we've been talking about for the last 45 minutes, Republican, especially Republican voters, but now even Republican politicians as a consequence are having to wake up to that fact that, that this alliance between the Chamber of Commerce and I would say a soft alliance between the Chamber of Commerce and, and Republicans, um, because the Chamber of Commerce worked with plenty of Democrats uh, even prior to this era. But, you know, generally speaking, Republicans, as we talked about, were, were kind of the pro-business party, Democrats, kind of the, the, the I don't know, I don't, wanna, I don't know what to say other than anti-business party, right? <laughs> um, and definitely not, not with Coolidge saying the business of America is business, right? So uh, how is it going to change the Democratic Party? Because uh, they have sort of this strong, they did have this strong socialist wing um, with Bernie Sanders. Seems to me that that peaked in 2016. And some of the younger adherents to it are really pivoting to focus on cultural issues, right? And even Bernie himself is, you know, doesn't doesn't often talk about the, the working class as often as he used to now. He always has to throw in the LGBTQQIA, BIPOC, you know, mm-hmm. all the the sort of cultural terms. Um, AOC started out, obviously, as a democratic socialist, right? Um, but 90% of what she talks about and focuses on now, it seems to me, are cultural issues and, and sort of woke issues, for lack of a better term. Uh, what is going to happen to the Democratic Party? Um, what's going to happen to their economic platform as the full kind of lobbying light of the Chamber of Commerce and big business turns at least in part out of necessity to their party rather than the Republican Party? Yeah, it's an important question. Uh, I think, you know, the, the sort of Bernie Sanders AFC wing is as obsessed as they are with actually like dividing the working class into like the good working class and the bad working class, you know, the good working class being, uh, you know, genderqueer, indigenous women of color, right? And the bad working class being, you know, the Trump base, right? Um, as obsessed as they are with that, their actual economic agenda is still very anti-business. And I don't think um, big business interests, and especially not sort of medium-sized business interests, because big business interests often benefit from kind of regulatory capture. Um, I don't think they're going to find friends in that part of the coalition. It is funny, though, because, you know, you've seen this sort of increasing friendliness between a Democratic Party that was traditionally the enemy of kind of consolidated corporate power um, and big corporations kind of fusing together in a lot of ways, which makes sense given the kind of convergence of their cultural ideas and their worldview, and the fact they often come from sort of a similar kind of social strata and class. Uh, But there are still these major discrepancies which kind of leave groups like the Chamber of Commerce hanging. I wrote a long piece about the Chamber of Commerce's pivot left in, I think, 2020 or 2021. And what I was noting, there's a lot of sort of fanfare about this at the time, is for the first time in the 2018 midterms, the Chamber of Commerce started donating to a bunch of Democrats. It started uh, uh, endorsing Democrats over Republicans, not the majority by any means, but I can't remember the number, but it was it was it was substantial, substantial number. And you've seen the Chamber of Commerce sort of um, uh, increasingly trying to make inroads to the Democratic Party because they sense that a their cultural worldview is close to the Democratic Party, and b that they increasingly have opponents in the Republican Party too. Whether it's immigration, whether it's kind of populist economics, trade, you know, you name it. Uh, Trump's effect on the Republican Party has been to pivot it away from the Chamber of Commerce and its attended interests. Um, and the same thing was true with, you know, if, if you look at all the big like Wall Street donors, I think they, it was like 10 to 1 Biden to Trump in 2020. Uh, but <laughs> the ironic thing is, uh, you know, six months after Biden got into power, if you look at the Chamber of Commerce's press releases, they're just mortified, right? You know, like the PRO Act, you know, union policies, regulation, government spending, like everything that the Chamber of Commerce actually cares about when it isn't, you know, virtue signaling about uh, um you know, cultural issues, like it's actually the actual material business interests of the business community it represents, uh, Biden has been bad for. Uh, and at the same time, because they pivoted, they've made a lot more enemies in the Republican Party. I think even Kevin McCarthy now is, you know, saying uh, derisive things about uh, the Chamber of Commerce. So <laughs> groups like that have no one to blame but themselves, right? They made this gamble where they tried to pivot to the Democratic Party, and they realized that substantively the Democratic Party's uh, economic agenda is still not good for business. 
Um, you know, I'm not a business Republican. I, 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 it's, I spend a lot of time criticizing business Republicans, but it's true that the Republican Party economic agenda is just better generally for business, maybe with the exception of the biggest businesses, uh, than the Democratic Party economic agenda. Democratic Party, when they get into power, they're going to be pro-union. They're going to be pro-public sector union. They're going to do tax and spend. They're going to expand the regulatory state. Um, and they're going to try to sort of, uh, uh, sort of technocratically administer the economy because they think they know how to do it better than a lot of business leaders. And business leaders understandably find that objectionable. And I, I don't see that changing anytime soon. I think it's like a large part of what the Democratic Party is. So th they will get closer with corporations, I think, on stuff like cultural issues and also on immigration is obviously an important part. Um, but I don't necessarily know, you know, like the Wall Street donations didn't change Biden's loyalty to unions, right, or his kind of regulatory agenda. And the Chamber of Commerce shift, you know, all of the Democrats that they endorsed uh, hilariously within six months of getting into Congress uh, voted for the PRO Act, which was like number one on the Chamber of Commerce's kill list. Um, so the Democrats are still Democrats, basically, right? And, you know, the, the, the business interests that have tried to ally themselves uh, with with the Democratic Party have found uh, that the Democratic Party is still going to do what the Democratic Party always does when it gets into power. And it has the added uh, negative consequence of angering a lot of Republicans. Um, so I don't know exactly what it's going to do to change the Democratic Party agenda, except just further radicalize its cultural program. Uh, but I, I do know that it increasingly looks like the business interests trying to play both sides has been awful for a lot of the business interests. I, I honestly wish uh, Woke Inc. a happy dance ticket with Elizabeth yeah. Warren. Yeah. Um, long, long may they waltz. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's kind of my perspective. But uh, Nate Hockman, thank you so much for um, coming on, explaining this reporting. I really do think, uh, like I said at the top of the hour, you know, th this is not a story about South Dakota. This is a story about all of the forces both within and without both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party um, about the sort of a decline of the political and of democratic power, small d democratic power. Um, and, and actually one of the few hopeful, I think, threads in our, our politics, the, the potentiality for, for, for using political power to push back against some of these things um, and actually implement democratic interests of voters. So uh, thanks for your reporting. I think you, you were overly modest. I think it, it um, absolutely was, was the difference maker here um, exposing these things made a difference in South Dakota, and I'm hoping that continuing going forward, your reporting can can make a difference, uh, exposing more of this kind of dynamic and and letting Republican voters, um, you know, register their dissent with it. So, thanks for coming on again, Nate. Yeah, thanks, Inez. That was a lot of fun. Um, and before we close out, I want to. Uh, uh, let everyone know that if you enjoy this podcast, you should continue, um, you should consider tuning into Federalist Radio Hour, which is a daily podcast hosted by uh, none other than Emily Jashinsky. You've seen her on here every month uh, for our After Dark episodes. Um, the Federalist team of fearless journalists, including Molly Hemingway, Eddie Scary, and David Harciani, all join the fun breaking down politics and culture through interviews with politicians, entertainers, and thought leaders. It's smart, irreverent, provocative, and on the cutting edge of American political thought. Emily interviews thinkers from the right, the center, even the left. The show covers every topic imaginable from niches like data, data privacy and immigration to big picture issues like feminism. If you want to be part of that conversation, don't miss Federalist Radio Hour, which is available every weekday wherever you download your podcasts. And also, thank you to the listeners of this <laughs> this program, High Noon. High Noon with Inez Stepman is a production of the Independent Women's Forum. As always, you can send comments and questions to inez.stepman at iwf.org. Please help us out by hitting the subscribe button and leaving us a comment or review. That really, really helps with the algorithms um, on Apple Podcasts, Acast, Google Play, YouTube, and iwf.org. Be brave, and we'll see you next time on High Noon. <laughs>